Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today's lesson is, uh, as you know, it's lecture four, and I'm going to cover two theorems today, Thevenin's theorem and uh, maximum power transfer theorem. Um, it's going to be a long one, and I want to do an example with both theorem in the end. So, um, yeah. The session aim, um, to be able to understand the theory as well as analytics of Thevenin and maximum power transfer theorems, breaking it down into the two learning objectives, the main two learning objectives as, this, as the session aim states, is to understand the theory and analytics of Thevenin as well as the theory and analytics of maximum power transfer theorems. The reason why I'm doing the two in the same week, uh, because they both go along with each other. Um, if I do the maximum I will then again have to do the Thevenin theorem with it. Uh, so it's probably best to do both um, in the same week or at the same time. Right, so learning objective to understand the theory and analytics of Thevenin first and then apply this, the theory of Thevenin to develop the maximum power transfer through the um, through the circuit, given circuit. So we will try to do it with the help of two examples and uh, obviously there will be some tutorials which you will be doing with Husnan and uh, they will help you achieve this particular week's topic. Uh, before we go on to the example and step of the evidence theorem, let's have a look at the standard statement. It's a good idea to have a look at the standard statement of any theorem before going on to the analytics. Um, are the stepwise calculations. So if you have any two terminal linear bilateral DC network, uh, we can replace it by an equivalent cons uh, circuit consisting of a voltage source and a series resistor as shown below. So for example, you have a linear network, um, any circuit with resistors in it, let's say, uh, a combination of resistors inside this box. You've purchased a power supply from, from market or you purchased any PCB from market. Linear network with two terminals where we connect the power supply or we connect the load. Um, so if it was a circuit you purchased from, uh, from market, you might end up supplying power to it on these terminals. Or if it is a power supply itself, you might end up supplying some load into it. So these are your end terminals and box contains the actual circuit. We don't know exactly what the actual circuit is yet. We will discuss in detail um, in some time, but it, a generic case, any circuit inside this box and you have a load connected to it. Now in this box, if there is a series of resistors, voltage sources, current sources, um, and other components, what you can do is to replace this box with an equivalent voltage of its internal um, combination appearing across these terminals, as in a VES or V7, and you sometimes call it, and a series resistance attached into this, uh, attached in series with this VES, which is RS or sometimes called R7 in RTH, and then you can reconnect your load. Uh, RL across these terminals A and B. So you whatever's inside here is actually this bit. And you can convert any given linear circuit into a combination of a voltage in series with a resistor. And let's see how. Now, let's see, for example, inside this box, you had a very simple circuit, a simple network of two resistors R1 in series with R2 supplied by a voltage V. And then you've connected a load resistor in parallel to these terminals A and B. You can see we have uh, discussed resistors in series and parallel last week. So you should be able to determine that this resistor is actually going in parallel uh, to this R2. Right, so we have inside this dotted lines is your linear network containing several EMS. Well, at the moment we have only one and some resistances at the moment we have only two. Then what we can do is whatever's inside this dotted box, we can convert it into this, a voltage source in series with the resistor. At the moment we have two of them, 
how we can convert it into an equivalent voltage source with a series resistance RS. And then this RL is nothing but this RL. So nothing changes at the load terminal. So if we have a simple case, we can convert this internal uh, into this combination. If we have then a complicated case, slightly complicated, not very complicated as to what you will see in market, the big uh, circuits or big power supplies available in the market. This is slightly complicated case where you have not only two resistors and not only series and uh, not only parallel combination. You do have series and parallel combinations with multiple volt voltage sources. And RL is somewhere jungle in between the, this complete circuit. So this linear network in this case will be everything apart from this load resistor and your terminals coming out of this box will be these terminals where you actually connect your load. Uh, now all this stuff will be boxed inside this, maybe folded or somehow uh, boxed inside this and whatever is coming out is your RL. What you can do again, convert all this big circuit into an equivalent voltage source with a series resistance RS. So we've considered two examples, the previous one where we had a simple case and this one where we had a, a complicated case, both um, with the help of the Thevenin theorem, we can convert into a general or generic case of the equivalent model or equivalent circuit. Uh, again, demonstrated that if these were the two cases, you can simply represent them with the help of a Thevenin voltage or VS. Vs is nothing different to a Thevenin voltage, which is an equivalent voltage appearing across these two terminals, across these two terminals, across these two terminals, at terminals A and B I'm talking about, whether it's a small A or a capital A. Right, um, Vth is the voltage in series with Rth, and Rth is the series and parallel combination of these resistors solved as to what it will appear across these two terminals A and B, the terminals A and B in this case, and the terminals capital A and B in this case. So let's say uh, we have converted it, but how? How we actually achieve converting this complex into this, converting this complex into this? There is a stepwise procedure which we will go through. And the number one step in that procedure is to remove the portion of the network uh, which the Thevenin equivalent is to be found across. In the figure shown, this requires that the load resistor RL to be temporarily removed from the network and mark the terminals of the remaining two terminal network. So what it is saying? that we were establishing the Thevenin equivalent model across this load. So wherever you are establishing, just take that load or R or resistor out and keep them terminals open circuited. Similarly, in this case, this RL exists here. So take it out and keep these two terminals open circuited here. It exists across these two terminals. Take it out and keep these two terminals open circuited. So if you do that for the simple case, what you will have obviously taken RL out will give you these two terminals open circuited or you can have two legs going here, uh, two wire segments going there, but it will not mean anything than anything different than this. So what we've done is taken this RL out, disconnected it, and obviously these two terminals are now open circuit as compared as compared to previously how they were connected through RL. Right, so that's the first step. What you do is take RL out of the circuit or load, load terminal or the terminal across which you want to determine the Thevenin equivalent, take it out of the circuit. What you do for the second thing or second um, step. Second step is um, to label the current directions in the new circuit. 
So not in your original circuit, which was this. Once you've taken RL out, now label the currents. Now, obviously, if we have a voltage source, power source here, that will drive current through here. There is no other way for this current to go other than this way. So all of the current generated by this voltage source will go through R1 and carry on to the terminal A. And there is no other way for this current to go other than this. So all of the current available at this point will go through R2. And then there is no other way for this current to go to other than from B back to the voltage source. So you see, there is only one loop and all the current generated by this V will be shared, uh, will be the same through R1 and R2. So for example, if we generate uh, five amps of the current here by voltage source, the current through R1 will be five amps and through the R2 it will be five amps as well and then coming back here. So if we want to label these, we have labeled generic case. Let's say I1 was the total current generated by V, the power source, and going there, there is no other way. So all of this is going there and there's no other way. So all of this is going back and hence going back into the voltage source. So at the moment we have a single loop. Well, in the, in the example two we consider there will be more than one loop. So that will be a bit more complicated case. So what we've done, we've taken our allowed in the first in the first step. In the second step, what we've done is we've labeled the current directions in the circuit, in the new circuit. If there was another loop, then we would have labeled across that one as well. Then next, after we've labeled, apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to determine unknown currents. There is only one unknown current. We can see there is only one current anyway which is what we have to determine or we have to find as in a part or uh, some second B part of the second step. Uh, to do that, we always um, write the expression of the Kirchhoff's voltage law. It's the best practice. Um, we did determine this in the last lecture, not last lecture, two weeks before, that the Kirchhoff's voltage law says some of the voltage rises in a loop or in a closed path is equal to the sum of the voltage drops in a closed path, in that closed path. So in this closed path, we have that source which will give you a voltage rise, that resistor which will give you a voltage drop, that resistor which will give you a voltage drop. Right, so we have one source, two drops, and Ohm's law tells us what these drops are. V is equal to IER. So if we wanted to determine V1 or VR1, that will be I1 times R1. And V2 or VR2, that will be I1 times R2. Right, so again, substituting or expanding this one, we have the rise as in a V, so we've stated there. And we have two drops, some of them drops is V1 plus V2, and V1 is given by I1 R1, plus V2 is given by I1 R2. Let's assume some values of I, uh, sorry, R1 and V. Normally you will not be given the value of current because you are determining current, but you will be given the value of this voltage and the values of the resistances. But we've assumed that say V is equal to 10 volts, R1 is equal to five ohms, R2 is equal to 10 ohms. Substituting in there, we have 10 is equal to R1 is 5, so 5 times I1 is 5 I1. Uh, R2 is 10, so 10 times I1 is 10 I1. Again, then 10 I1 plus 5 I1, 15 I1 is equal to 10. Solving it, we will get I1 is equal to 0.67 amps. So we've done the second step. It said label the currents. We've labeled it. Find the value of currents. We've found the value of only current in this circuit. Uh, if there were more, then we would have simultaneous. We would have done simultaneous equations and would have done uh, all the values of all the currents. But in this case, we have only one. Let's carry on. The third step. The point at which this A terminal and B terminal, at which we want to determine the Thevenin equivalent model or Thevenin equivalent circuit, at that point, 
I then start looking, what is the equivalent resistance appearing across these two terminals or these two terminals? Uh, equivalent resistance. To do equivalent resistance, I have done one thing, short circuited the voltage source. However, if you're given an internal resistance of a voltage source, V, then you would replace it by its internal resistance across here, these two terminals. However, we are not given that there is an internal resistance of V. So we will assume that it is a, an ideal voltage source with no internal resistance. If it is an ideal voltage source with no internal resistance, we might as well short circuit it because it doesn't have any resistance and we want to establish or we want to determine the total resistance of this path. So since this one doesn't have any resistance, we've short circuited. However, if there was a current source instead of a voltage source, what you then do is open circuit the current source. So open these terminals. There is no this wire in between if that was a current source. Any other current sources in there, you will open circuit in. Or if there is an equivalent resistance, you would replace it by that equivalent resistance. Now, at these terminals, I am looking from this end, not from this end. I am looking from this end. I want to determine what is the equivalent resistance between these two or this entire circuit. And I see that this R1 is in parallel to R2. Why? Because I did say the condition last time that they should be sharing only one terminal, which they are, uh, but they are sharing the other terminal as well. So that makes them parallel. Also, I did say there shouldn't be any line or any other uh, to other wire going from this terminal. There is. So that makes these two as in a parallel. If they are in parallel, we did discuss a case, a special case for parallel resistors last week, saying when R1 is in parallel to R2, the equivalent of them will become the product of them divided by some of them. Or what you can do is to do 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 is equal to 1 over RTH. That will be a slightly more complicated way of doing it, which will again give you the same kind of uh, result. So we might as well do this. So substituting the value for R1, which is 5, and substituting the value for R2, which is 10, you have 10 times 5 divided 10 plus 5. So then you have 50 divided 15, which is 3.34 ohms. So that is the value of equivalent resistance, which will be appearing across these two terminals. Now, if I go back what I wanted originally, I wanted seven in resistance or RS, equivalent resistance of this entire circuit. And I have determined this seven in. Now what I need is V seven in or seven in voltage or equivalent voltage across these two terminals. And that will be my next step, but let's carry on. R seven in I have found in the step three, the step four, obviously it will be V seven in. Now, to do the V7, and what I've done is I've taken again the same circuit here, put V back in, because I'm determining voltage now, not equivalent resistance. I've put V back in, 10 volt, um, 10 volt power source. And what I've done is I have assumed that a voltage source is connected across here. Or what you can do in a practical scenario, is to connect a voltmeter across these two terminals and determine the open circuit voltage. Or in a simulation environment, connect a voltmeter uh, in a multi-sim environment across these two terminals and that will give you the VTH value. However, I want to do analytically, what I will do, there is no such a voltage source really here, but I will connect this voltage source imaginary voltage source and apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to determine its value. That is one of the ways to do it analytically. So I have connected this one and um, it's again, it's imaginary, it's not real. So these dotted lines 
demonstrate that this is imaginary. And how I can find the value of this VTH is apply uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law into any of the loops, uh, probably the simplest one with VTH in it. So you have a loop available from the to the including VTH, or you have a slightly simpler one from A to VTH, then going back to B and then to A. Now you see, um, here, if I apply Kirchhoff's voltage loss, Kirchhoff's voltage law in this loop two says, some of the voltage rises is equal to some of the voltage drops. Now, I am, I have got this voltage source and I have got this voltage drop. But think, I am going from terminal A to VTH and entering from a positive terminal of the battery and leaving from a negative terminal of the battery, which will actually be dropping the voltage or it will be a negative rise on the other side, rise. So this voltage source is actually acting opposite to where I want to go. And I am going here in the loops direction, and I'm going against the direction of current through R2, which will again convert this I1 into minus I1 because I'm going against it. So let's demonstrate this with the help of the equation. So I started going from the A terminal to VTH, that gave me minus VTH because I was entering from a higher potential and leaving from a negative potential or lower potential. So that is actually a drop or acting against the direction of the voltage equals minus I1 because I'm going against the direction of a current and the sign changes if I'm going against the direction. So minus I1, R2. So that's the voltage drops here, that's the voltage rises. Again, even if it is a negative voltage rise or a positive voltage rise, uh, it will be mentioned here, but the sign will actually tell the story. Right, so minus VTH is equal to minus I1 R2. We've already determined I1 in the step two, if you remember, 0.67. So minus I1 will be minus 0.67, and R2 we've been given to be 10 ohms. Substituting the values, we've got the value V thevenin is equal to 6.7 volts. Uh, so we're, what we've done, we've determined R thevenin and we've determined V thevenin. What next step is? Just simply remodeling the circuit. So if you remember, our original circuit was this. And we've remodeled it in the form of a thevenin voltage which is 6.7 in step four, and R7 in 3.34 from step three. Now, whichever load we connect, whatever value of RL, what we can do is we can determine the current flowing through the load by using the formula saying total voltage divides total resistance. Total voltage is only one VTH, only one voltage here. Total resistance is the sum of these two. So what you can do is determine the value of the current in this. And then this dotted box is you have Thevenin equivalent model. Now this RL is not actually a part of the Thevenin equivalent model, but what you, you've, uh, you've done is connected across the terminals of Thevenin equivalent model. Right, um, then you, what you can also do is determine the voltage drop across this. If you've done IL, uh, voltage drop across this is using Ohm's law. Ohm's law says VL is equal to IL RL. If you know the value for RL and you also determine the value for IL, you can then determine VL. We can also determine a power uh, transferred or power consumption across the load resistor, across your component, your load, your uh, whatever device you want to run through this power supply um, using I squared RL because we've already determined I from here. And if we know the value for RL, you can determine RL. So we will give a value for RL in the maximum power transfer theorem now, and then try to determine uh, what maximum power transfer theorem is. So that was your Thevenin theorem, five different steps, 
set one was to take out the load or the terminal um, across which you want to determine the Thevenin equivalent out of, out of the circuit. So that will be open circuit. Determine the R equivalent or R Thevenin across that terminal. Determine V Thevenin or equivalent voltage across that terminal. Remodel it in the Thevenin form. And then you can find a current voltage or power across your load. Then the next theorem we want to discuss today is maximum power transfer theorem. This is best to understand with a little exercise uh, of varying the value of this RL. But we will first determine what statement it is. Well, the statement is the maximum power transfer theorem states a load will receive maximum power from a linear bilateral DC network when its total resistive value is exactly equivalent to Thevenin resistance of the network as seen by the load. Now, if we've established the Thevenin equivalent model, that's when we can apply the maximum power transfer theorem anyway. So that's why it was best practice to determine the Thevenin equivalent model of the circuit first and then apply the maximum power transfer theorem. So maximum power transfer theorem statement says when this exactly becomes equal to R Thevenin, the load resistor becomes equal to R Thevenin, that's when you will draw the, the maximum power through this load resistor. So that is the condition. So when, generic case, when this RL will become equal to R Thevenin, that's when you will have maximum power transfer through the load. Now let's assume the values again, or not assume, we've calculated these values RTH and VTH up over first simplest circuit, the example we've done with the uh, with the Thevenin's theorem already. Let's take these values and try to variate the values of RL from zero to let's say four ohms with a division of 0.2 ohms and try to determine the values of power and current using them two formulas, which we've established in the um, while I was delivering max, uh, while I was delivering the Thevenin theorem already. So if we variate the values of this one, we've got all the other values RTH, VTH, RTH, VTH. If that keeps varying, we will have current keep varying. If current keeps varying, we will have that keep varying. So let's do that. And I've done that with the help of an exercise, a small exercise where I have kept VTH in an Excel document, uh, kept VTH first column, a constant because that was constant, RTH a constant value 3.34 ohms. And what to do is variate RL from no to 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1 and so on to up to 4 ohms. And then apply a formula on this fourth column to determine the value of current through RL. Uh, that formula will do is divide this 6.7 by 3.34 plus whatever value your RL is. So in first case, it probably zero. So it will be 6.7 divide 3.34 and so on. It keeps on adding this value at the bottom. And you see that's 2.005 and then 1.8, 1.7, 1.70. So it's slightly decreasing. And then at this point, 1.16, 1 1.1, you've got 1.002 at when RL becomes equals to R Thevenin. But we said power will be maximum at this point. Let's see how we've calculated power. Squaring this bit and then timesing by this column. So square of this times by this, square of this times by this, square of this times by this, and so on. Can everybody hear me? I'm here. I'm getting feedback that you've got no sound. Yes, you can hear. So it's probably somebody's connection. Uh, you can rejoin again. Right. OK, so I was saying the power should be maximum when these two become equal. That's what our condition was. RL is equal to RTH. At this point, they become equal. And you see the power is 
and you don't have any other power more than this 3.36. You see, you have 1.2, 1.7, 2.0, 2.3. 2 so it was slightly increasing, 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 going to 3, 3.1, 3.2, 3.26, 3.30, 3.35, uh, 3.36. And then it started going down. You see? So it's not that this will keep on increasing. At that point, it will go to maximum and then will start going down. And what's best is to plot PL with RL and then C. So what I've done is plotted PL on the Y axis and RL on the X axis. So basically plotted on this Excel table, RL versus PL and uh, line graph. And you can see the maximum point I get is this point, 3.34 RL's value. And I have got the P's value as in 3.36, which is what I've said already on the table. So that means I have then proven the maximum power will be transferred when your internal resistance of the circuit, which is RTH, becomes equals to the load resistance RL of the circuit, which is this point. So that was our condition RL is equal to RTH at this point. It was 3.34 RL's value, which is your RTH, and that's what we've proven with the help of example one. The second circuit we considered in the start, if you see uh, figure three in the start, we said if the linear network was a slightly complicated one. Let's apply the same uh, five steps of seven and, and then some steps of the maximum power transfer to recall, to summarize what we've learned in the seven and the maximum power transfer theorem. So if our circuit was this one, instead of a very simple R1, R2 and then RL, we have more than one voltage sources, we have more than one uh, resistors in series as well as in parallel. Um, and RL is somewhere inside between the network. Uh, let's see what we will do. The first step you would have done again in the similar case is to take out RL out of the circuit or wherever you'd want to determine the Thevenin equivalent across terminals A and B. So if we take RL out, our circuit becomes this. I've just taken this load out of the circuit and put him somewhere aside. This has nothing to do with this anymore. Well, finally, we will connect it back. But let's first determine the equivalent model, the Thevenin equivalent model of this one. So what we do in the step two, label the currents and find out the values of the current. So in the step two, label the currents. So you see, I have this voltage source, which will draw the current in here, which will keep on going, going, going. At this point, there was some way, but that's blocked. This is open circuit, so no current will go here. All of that current will keep going. So at this point, from there to there, the current is staying the same. The all current generated by this voltage source is going from uh, up to here. At this point, node node for terminal uh, sorry voltage source v2 and v1 this between r3 and r4 the point we will have current divided because that current coming from here and there might be a current from the depending if that's zero or there is some value of the voltage if there is zero then that current might be going downwards so this current splitting into downwards and the. The thing is, we don't know if that's greater than this. V2 is greater than V1. V2 has a value or not. If it is zero or not. So I use, I mean, there's many ways of doing this. I always use the convention of taking the current direction from left hand side and then keep on splitting it. Uh, let's say that's I1 and then split it into I2, I1 take away I2, or I2 and I1 take away I2. Uh, if this voltage source has some value and the current will be going upward, eventually you will find out negative value of this current. So don't, don't worry about that there is a voltage source, so this current should be going up. Let's keep the convention that the current is starting from the left hand side, carries on going, then splits wherever your node is, and then goes there and there, 
comes back here. Now the current is coming from there and coming from there. So add up to produce this current, which will be this. So I have said I1 was generated originally, carried on going, carried on going at this point, split it up into let's say that was I2. And that current, that value of the current taken away from this is what you will have here. Now, if that has some value, this current might be going upwards, but that means you will have a negative value of I1 take away I2 eventually when you find out. But let's not get confused into that one yet. OK, so I2 is going there and I1 take away I2 is going downwards. I2 carries on. There is no other uh, route for it to go. All of it is going there, going to the point D. At point D, you have a current coming from uh, this point I2 and you have a current coming from that point I1 take away I2. Kirchhoff's current law says at a point or at a node, some of the currents coming in should be equal to some of current uh, going or leaving. There's only one leaving. So these two added together will give this. So let's add them together. I1 take away I2 plus I1 is this. If you expand this bracket, this I2 will cancel with this because that's negative and that's positive. So eventually you will have I1. So I1 is going there, then carrying on to continue. Your distribution is always correct if you have the same amount of current leaving coming back into the left hand side. OK. Now it also says apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to determine the unknown currents. We have I1 and I2, two unknown currents now. So what we will do is we will have two loops. This loop with V1 and V2 in it and the second loop from C to coming back to D and then coming back to D, uh, C. So C, D and C. Let's apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. Kirchhoff's voltage law, there's two loops, so we will have two equations. Kirchhoff's voltage law again says rises is equal to drops, sum of the rises is equal to sum of the drops, and that's going to be for each loop. Let's apply Kirchhoff's voltage law in the loop one which is this loop. I hope you can see the pointer. Right, OK. If I apply the Kirchhoff's voltage law, the rises, the voltage sources, V1 and V2 are acting opposite. You see, positive terminal, positive terminal. This will draw current in this direction. This will draw in this direction. So some of or the overall rise will be that, taken away that so v1 take away v2 and you have a drop first drop r1 second drop r3 third drop r4 in this loop and drop is established by ohm's law i1 r1 is through r1 so you have that i1 r3 is through r3 so you have that and then you have drop through r4 which is i1 times r4 because that added up to make I1, so I1 times R4. And that is my equation one. If I then apply Kirchhoff's voltage law into loop two, which is my green loop, loop two, you see, I will have the voltage source is V2. There is no other voltage source in this loop, loop two, green loop. So I will have Sources, sum of sources or sum of rises is V2 equals one drop and two drop. So first drop is I2 times R5. Second drop is I2 times R6. And that is my equation two. Now let's give some values, give some numbers out and then try to find out the actual values of I1 and I2. Assume that V1 was equal to 10 volt. Uh, V2 was equal to 2 volt, R1, R3, and R5. Sorry, yeah, R1 is equal to 2 volt, R3 is equal to, sorry, 2 ohms, R3 is equal to 2 ohms, R4 is equal to 3 ohms, R5 is 2, and R6 is 2. So these are the values. Then my circuit uh, 
will become with these values. So I've just mentioned these values here. Then the loop equations, if you go back, the first loop equation was V1 take away V2. So 10 take away 2, 10 take away 2. It's equal to I1 times R1. We don't have I1's value, but we have R1's value. So 2 I1's plus R3's value is what? 2 again. So 2 I1's plus R4's value is what? 3. So 3 I1's. So that will make 2 I1 plus 2 I1 plus 3 I1. Adding these all together, 7 I1s, and that gives me I1 is equal to 1.4, 1.14 amps. So I know that this value of the current is 1.14 amps. Similarly, applying or giving the values in loop 2, I have 2 is V2 is equal to 2 volts, so 2 is equal to R5 is 2, so 2 I2. R6 is 2, so 2 I2. So then that will have 2i2 plus 2i2 is equal to 2. Then that add up 4i2 is equal to 2. Then gives me i2 is equal to 0.5 amps. So I have all the values of currents, i1 and i2. If I wanted to determine i1 take away i2, that will be 1.14 take 0.5. And it is a positive value. So that means current would actually be going down. So what I assumed. Right, so step three again. What did I do in the step three in the first simple example to find out RTH? And to do that, what I did is short circuit the voltage sources. I've done again similar. If I had equivalent resistance of the voltage sources, I would have replaced them with the equivalent resistance. But I don't, so I've short circuited. Now, finding the value of equivalent resistance at this point is what I want to do. You see, you're not going to find at this point where it was probably these two are in series and uh, then that series combination of them, of them in parallel with these or something. But we are finding here. So let's try to sum your circuit up by solving the other values and sum up here. So first thing I can see is these two are in series, R5 and R6. So our equivalent of R5 and R6 will add up to become four ohms and I have replaced all this section by its equivalent first. It's, it's a good practice to do it stepwise. Now you see this resistor is in parallel with this zero resistance and I always solve the parallel resistances by saying here, by saying zero is in parallel to our equivalent so that will be product over sum. So product of zero with our equivalent divide zero plus our equivalent gives me a zero so that means this all section gives me an equivalent resistance of zero. Well, this is short circuit anyway, so nothing will go from there. So you don't have any resistance basically. Uh, so what we've done is replaced all this section with our equivalent and a shorted line with a short because it's zero. So that's a zero resistance. Again, I'm summing up to this I point. Now you see these R3 and R4 are in series because it's sharing only one terminal and there's nothing other than this going which is not a short circuit not a complete line anyway so these two are in series so what I can do is R3 is added into R4 to give me the next equivalent R equivalent to so R3 plus R4 is 5 ohms and I have replaced all this section by 5 ohm resistor Again, these two are in parallel. You see why they are in parallel? Because I am looking at this point. So they are sharing one terminal, but there is another line going where I am looking across, where I'm going to attach my load. So these two are in parallel. And what I do for parallel is R1 equivalent uh, is in parallel to R2. So product of over sum. So product over sum gives me 1.43. So RTH value, which will appear across here, is 1.43. So I have calculated RTH. The next step, R4, uh, sorry, next step I was going to do is to find out the VTH of Thevenin and equivalent. And for Thevenin and equivalent, I have again assumed a Thevenin voltage source at terminal A and B. I will apply the KVL in the simplest loop, the loop one. Well, somebody want to do in a complicated could do in this big one 
it's up to you. But I would always like to do in the simplest one. Okay, so applying KVL in simplest one, you have sources, these two. So V1 take away VTH is equal to I1 times R1, which is done here. Um, then re rearranging it to make VTH is equal to V1 take away I1 R1, substituting values. You've got Thevenin's voltage 7.72. So remodeling the step five, we have Thevenin voltage 7.72. R7 in the series 1.43 uh, and then we can apply any of these to find out current voltage and power. So that was the example of a complicated circuit, slightly complex circuit with Thevenin. Let's do the maximum power transfer with this one then. The maximum power should transfer when RL should be equal to 1.43. So if I go on to the next slide I have Done again the similar case where I, have, I am varying the values of RL from 0 to 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, keeping RCH and VTH constant to 7.72 and 1.42 correspondingly. And then I'm calculating I and P. So you see the maximum value of this P is reached 10.419 at point where RL is equal to RTH 1.43. So that's proven twice the maximum power transfer, which says your RL equals to RTH. That, that's when uh, your maximum power will transfer through the load. Uh, that's the lecture for today. Recalling the objectives. It's always a good idea to recall. Have we understand the theory and analytics of Thevenin's theorem? I hope we have. We understood the maximum power transfer condition and its calculations. Well, RL is equal to RTH. And calculation through that Excel sheet. Any questions?